Well, good evening. Good to be with you guys. Um, when I told my wife that I was going to Seaside for a speaking engagement, I did not think of this kind of weather. But it's good to be here nevertheless. I did think of Christ. And so that's going to be the object of our focus over the next few days. Tonight, we're looking at the glory of Christ. And then tomorrow, we will look at Christ, uh, Christ with you in the pain of ministry. Then Christ in you in the pace of ministry. And then Christ for you in the promise of ministry. So lots of Christ, <laughs> which I'm thrilled about, and I'm sure you are too. Uh, this evening we will be in Hebrews chapter 1, if you want to turn there. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you uh, from a variety of places, um, encouraged, disheartened, eager, um, just flat, confused, suffering, hopeful, but we come to you. <laughs> we come to you, Christ from all different directions, and we pray that you would minister to us this week. Chief Shepherd, would you pastor us, your imperfect and struggling pastors, oh, perfect, sovereign and all-sufficient Lord Jesus, would you meet us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, I took my family on a trip to England. and We went to the Lake District, which is like rolling green hills, dotted with sheep, ancient fences, and it's where I grew up. My mother's British and my dad is American, and we took our three kids back to see where I grew up. And after we visited the homes, we made our way down to London, where we attended the Championships Wimbledon. Now, this was a dream come true for me. I'd played tennis since a child. My dad taught me to play tennis. And my mother, who grew up in London, used to queue up uh, in the afternoons to make it in as they let school children in to watch the matches. It was there, it was the centennial celebration of center court. And because of that, they brought out a prior winners of the grand championships. Uh, Venus Williams, Maria Sharapova, uh, Novak Djokovic, uh, the, the Brit himself, uh, Andy Murray, which was met with a, a round of hearty applause. And then one more player made his way out, Roger Federer. And the Brits lost their minds. The whole court was filled with deafening praise. Why? I mean, Novak has beat Djokovic with titles, but Federer plays with a beauty and excellence, you might say a glory, that no others have played with. The glory of Federer was on view, and it was an incredible privilege 
to watch him play. The Puritan John Owen said, Beholding the beauty and the glory of Christ is the greatest privilege a believer can have in this life and in the next. So let's slow down together. Let's consider, indulge in this greatest of privileges as we behold the glory of Christ in his creativity, in his beauty, and in his excellence. His creativity. Jesus is more creative than we can comprehend. In creation and in culture, Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, God has spoken to us through his Son, who he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Well, this passage tells us a lot of things about Christ. We won't look at all of it, but one thing that stands out to me is the, the creating through Christ. God the Father created all things through God the Son. Theologians call this the mediation of creation. Jesus speaks to us through his spirit-filled words, but he also speaks through his pretemporal acts, his works of creation. Now, Colossians amplifies this when it says that all things were made by him and through him and for him. All things exist for Jesus Christ. He is the agent of creation. Uh, St. Irenaeus, the church father, helps us kind of work this out. What does it mean for uh, Jesus to be the agent or the mediator of creation? And he used a metaphor, uh, the two hands of the Father, that, that God the Father created the world through the hands of the Spirit and of the Son. Now, why, why was this necessary? Well, if God created only by himself, you could reason that creation would fall back into himself. But through mediating through the Spirit and the Son, there is a distinction that is made, a, an agency through which all things are made, and there is a distinction between the creator and the creation. We're told that Jesus upholds and sustains the world. But there's more going on here than just fashioning the earth. The word world is the word, not the usual word, cosmos. It's the word aeon. We get ages. Through Jesus, all the ages, all of space and time was created. It's not just terrestrial life, it's celestial life. It's an expansive work of God through Jesus Christ. He made the white stars and the red speckled bass. He made the blue bonnets of Texas and the seagulls cutting through the air out there as you walk across the bridge. He made the elements of the periodic table and the law of gravity, the sparkling sea, flowers aflame with color. Jesus made and sustains everything. And that includes our churches. Our churches are made and sustained by Jesus. Christ made our churches, and Christ sustains our churches, not us. <laughs> and that is a relief. If this is true, that Jesus sustains and upholds all things, that all things hold together, budgets and buildings, 
messy marriages, rebellious children, adulterous staff members. If Jesus holds all things together, then the pressure is off of us to hold the church together. Jesus holds all things together. He sustains the church. You say, well, what if the finances fail? What if the church splits? What if there's a pastoral failure? Does Christ uphold all of that? What if my worst nightmare comes true? Eighteen years ago, we moved to Austin, Texas to plant a church downtown, and uh, we got to see God do remarkable and redemptive things in a very countercultural, resistant city. And it was a incredible privilege to plant and to pastor City Life Church. And after 18 years, we closed the doors to City Life Church. For some of you, this is your worst nightmare, the closing of your church. Perhaps you're anxious about it even now. Maybe there are some threats, moral, spiritual, financial. What if the church doesn't make it? What if it falls apart? Don't get me wrong, I I grieved at the closing of our church, but I was also comforted by this. Christ sustains his church. Not me. Christ sustains his church. The local church is temporary, but the eternal church is forever. No one can close the church. (laughs) Jesus sustains the church by virtue of creation and redemption. No one can cancel the church. Jesus Not pastors or pastor's wives or counselors or elder teams. Jesus sustains the church. He sustains everything through creation, and he also sustains culture. Jesus made all the things from which we make all things. He created creative people. So, in an original sense and in a derivative sense, Jesus makes everything from the iPhone to the flower. So, what bearing might this have on our lives? Not just creation, but culture. Well, if all things are made in Him, then all things have value. If all things are made in Christ, all things have worth. Real Christianity doesn't value Christ and discard creation. True faith values the creator and his creation, which means what we make of the world in our ideas and in our work is a matter of worship. Our cultural activity is a matter of ministry. Beholding Christ doesn't just happen in the study or in the pew, but in all places. You're familiar with this poem by Gerald Manley Hopkins, the, when kingfishers catch fire? There's a phrase in there, that Christ plays in 10,000 places. And yet often we approach Christ as though he, he really only plays in religious spaces, in the study, in the preaching, in the counseling, in the discipleship. We compartmentalize Christ. What about Christ in our waking and in our sleeping, in our tennis and in our TV, in our exercise and in our entertainment? What would it look like to glory in Christ, not only in creation, but in culture? Let's take a few of these, waking and sleeping. You know that psalm, Psalm 90? I will declare your loving kindness in the morning and I will remember your faithfulness at night. It's a daily liturgy. 
what would it look like to apply that to each day? Instead of waking up and reaching for the phone and climbing in bed and scrolling for the phone, what would it look like to declare his loving kindness in the morning and to remember his faithfulness by night? When I wake up, I try to remember, try to declare the loving kindness of the Lord, that he loves us before we lift. He approves of us before we do anything for him. Declare his loving kindness to your soul when you wake up. Way better start to the day than Twitter and Instagram. What about in the evening when you climb in bed after a long day? I will remember his faithfulness by night. Instead of scrolling your feeds, scroll the graces of God. My children were fed today. <laughs> the gospel was preached today. My health is intact today. And on and on and on. Declare his loving kindness in the morning. Remember his faithfulness by night. Our waking and sleeping, but what about our... our uh, exercise and entertainment. I, I love to go for walks. The older I get, the longer I walk. Uh, it's a, something about walking with no one around but the Lord and just observing him in creation. I mean, just walking across the bridge here, seeing the water flow and thinking of the flowing grace of God in our lives. The seagulls, cutting. how do they do that? Just kind of float and cut through the air. We just moved into a new neighborhood, and I, I walk it every morning, and we have dogwood blossoms on trees that are perfectly symmetrical and snow white, and they just pop against the bright blue Texas sky, and I just admire the beauty and the creativity of God. We've got these little uh, birds that collect on trees, and they have little yellow tips. They're they're cedar wax wings. It's like God just took a little brush and said, I'm going to put a touch of yellow here on the, I mean, the creativity and the beauty of God. What about entertainment? Has anybody seen Dune 2? Or Dune 1, for that matter? Uh, striking cinematography in Dune 2. Denny Villeneuve's uh, bringing kind of George Herbert's world to life on the screen. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable and striking thing. Um, I read Dune a couple years ago, and I came across this statement in the book. Deep in the human unconsciousness is a pervasive need for a logical universe that makes sense. But the real universe is always one step beyond Logic. One step beyond. It's not anti rational, but it is transrational. We are meant to apprehend glories beyond what we can see as we look through beautiful cinematography and birds with yellow tails. Reminds me of C.S. Lewis's book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where Eustace attempts to show off his knowledge and sharing what scientists understand about the nature of the star. He says, in our world, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas. He's just boasting with pride with his scientific observation. And then a wise old man says to him, even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. I say, what is a star? It's red, orange, glory. It shoots beams of pink and red across the sky. It is itself a work of art. Christ calls us not merely to understand creation, but to look through creation and see the glory of the Creator. Christ melts our compartments. Christ plays in 10,000 places, in culture and in creation. All things 
are by Him and through Him and for Him. So let's cultivate an expansive spirituality that accounts for the many places in which Christ plays. Christ is more creative than we can comprehend. Jesus is not only more creative, he is also more beautiful. More beautiful than we behold. Verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. What is this word, radiance? What does it mean? It's the only place in the New Testament that this word appears. Radiance. And a radiance, this word doesn't mean the worth of a thing, it means the aesthetic of a thing, the glory of the thing, the beauty of a thing. Not the elemental composition of the sun, but the beauty, beautiful rays and colors it emits that crawl across the evening sky. Radiance. You know, when we say of a bride on her wedding day, um, you look radiant. What are we saying? You clean up nice? I hope not. No, we're saying you're gorgeous. You're beautiful. You're stunning. (laughs) The radiance of the glory of God is the beauty of Jesus Christ. The beauty of Christ is the glory of God. A radiance vividly described in Revelation chapter 1. Son of man clothed with a long robe, the golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his face like the sun, shining in full strength. The beauty of Jesus Christ. Notice there is a strength and there is a beauty. Eyes of fire and a face like the sun. So strong we might have to shield our eyes, but so beautiful we want to take a peek. Reminded me of a scene from Lord of the Rings. If you saw that movie, there's a scene where the fellowship gets derailed, and they make their way into the woodland elves, and they uh, come across a stunning Galadriel, the Lady of the Wood. The Lady of the Woods, whose hair is said to have ensnared the light of the two trees of paradisical Valinor. Her strength and beauty is so entrancing that it, it causes people to fear and adore her stealing the hearts of men and dwarves. Later on in the book, Gimli is said to have gone out west after the fellowship has completed its mission. And he goes out of great desire just to see her again. Oh, to be like Gimli, just driven by desire to see the beauty of Christ again and again and again. Morning and evening, glimpsing the radiance of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Our disposition should not be, I have so much to do today, I I can't really look at the glory of Christ. It shouldn't be that I have so many emails today that I just don't have time to gaze at the radiance of God. It shouldn't be that I have so much ministry to do that I cannot behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It should not be the case. Instead, it should be, you're so stunning, I can't not look, Lord. I want to take a peek at your radiance this morning. Your voice is so sweet, I can't not hear 
from your word. I'm so weak, I can't live without your strength. You see, Jesus' beauty is for beholding. When a tourist or a consumer visits the Musée d'Orsay or the Louvre or some museum, they, they make their way and they quickly check off the famous pieces, you know, Starry Night and uh, the Mona Lisa, the water lilies, and they can kind of congratulate themselves for seeing all these great beauties. <laughs> but they haven't seen the beauties. The consumer doesn't see the beauty, but the connoisseur slows down and sits on those benches right across from the works of art. And they observe how Monet plays with light in the water lilies. They see the flame of orange and red in the paintings. They take in the glory and the radiance of these works of art. Don't be a consumer of Christ. Be a connoisseur of Christ. Slowing down to take in the glory of Jesus. Maybe an illustration here on the screen. Uh, this is uh, Monet's San Giorgio Maggiore at dusk. He was going blind when he painted this. This was uh, one of the things that he wanted to capture. It's in Venice, and uh, he uh, thought that he couldn't do it. He, he doubted his ability. But look how he portrays the sunset. The brush strokes are little flames of fire moving across the water and up the sky like burning, burning brushes of glory. The consumer is way too busy to see the glory and the beauty. But the connoisseur is absorbed with the detail and makes out the outlines and the wonder and is moved by the beauty. Let's be connoisseurs of Christ, not mere consumers. Returning to Revelation, when John uh, saw this stunning vision of Christ, the glorified Christ, he fell to his knees as though dead until the Son of Man placed his hand upon him and gave him life and lifted him up. Perhaps you are cut by conviction at your indifference to the glory of Christ this evening. Reach out for the hand of Christ who will lift you up. Perhaps you have been convicted of your neglect of the beauty and the radiance of Jesus. Reach out your hand for that tender touch of that forgiving hand of Jesus. We are so easily consumed, aren't we, with accomplishment and busyness and our failures, often thinking about ourselves. And perhaps this evening we need to turn away from that self-preoccupation in repentance and look at the Christ with eyes of fire and with a hand of forgiveness and say, Lord, forgive me. I have neglected and belittled you. Will you slow down and gaze at the glory of Christ? Though dead, he lifts us up. Though cut, he heals. Come to Jesus, eyes of fire, face like the sun. Let's not check off his beauty. <laughs> Let's slow down and be connoisseurs of Christ. Jesus is more creative, more beautiful, and finally, more excellent than we imagine. Verse 3, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Jesus inherits a name more excellent than angels. <laughs> Why? 
because what he has done, because of what he has accomplished. These verses depict that redemptive view, the descent of Christ into flesh and on the cross, and the ascent of Christ in victorious triumph over sin, death, and hell. The gospel is the good news, <laughs> that Jesus has defeated sin, death, and evil through his own death and resurrection and is making all things new, even us. What a Christ. What an excellent Savior. Mired in our sin, now at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now why the right hand? It's a place of distinction, of esteem, and of power. He is more excellent. Jesus is merciful. Jesus is forgiving. Of those who put ministry before the master, who try to compartmentalize the cosmic Christ, he dies for our sins. Here we have a Jesus, not standing in celebration, but seated. Why? Why is he seated? The work is finished. It is complete. It is done so pastors and pastors' wives can rest, can observe his excellence, can take in his beauty, can be moved by his creativity. Behold the exalted Christ. His V-shaped work, he adds redemption to his resume. Creation and redemption, agent of all things, redeemer and reconciler of all things, Colossians 1. So will you come to the seat of Christ this evening with your sins and with your struggles? He is for you. He is more excellent than you imagine. He is more beautiful than you can comprehend. He is more creative than we can conceive. Behold Jesus Christ. Eyes like fire, face like the sun. Let's be connoisseurs of Christ. More creative, more beautiful, and more excellent than we have ever imagined. Surely beholding the glory of Christ is the greatest of all privileges in this life and in the life to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I will be the first to confess that I am too often indifferent to your beauty and your excellence in your creativity. How easily they become theological concepts and not a marvelous person. <laughs> Thank you that you reach out your tender forgiving hand to those cut to the heart by their own sin and that you lift us Oh, Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your beauty, your creativity, and your unparalleled excellence. Give us a heart to desire you more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you guys give Jonathan a hand? And actually, Jonathan, why don't you stay up here for a minute? Come on, we got, we got some Q&A, man. Um. So, hey, one of the things that was really encouraging um, was that we actually did not have a ton of engagement on Slido, and that means that they were dialed in to what you were saying uh, and everything. Yeah. And so thank you for serving us. Um, if you guys, James talked about it at the beginning, but if you want to go ahead uh, and click in uh, to the online ebook there, you can go uh, to the Q&A section, uh, and we do have some questions. Um, and so we're just going to spend about five, ten minutes kind of walking through these. Uh, Tim Smith and the band will come back up for a couple songs of worship, and then uh, we'll make sure to get you guys hopped up on sugar.
dinner with dessert from Guidestone at the end of this. Um, and so, Jonathan, um, you know, I love the analogy that you used talking about being a, a tourist and then kind of shifting to connoisseur. Um, and, and it sounded, I can almost hear in your voice, that you've probably had a season of ministry or life where you realized you were a tourist and something changed. So what was it for you that moved you from being a tourist to being a connoisseur of God's mercy and grace? Well, I, I don't know that I think of a particular time where there was a, a watershed. I'll have to let that kind of marinate a little bit more. But I will say uh, every week. Uh, every week I fall prey to spiritual tourism. Um, and that's why I desperately go to God, you know, each day and uh, declare his loving kindness in the morning and remember his faithfulness by night. I mean, uh, I, I often have to repent of, for a lack of desire for God. And um, he's gracious to, to move and forgive and to enkindle desire for him. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a weekly, if not daily, uh, reality. Um, but, but the turning, you know, Robert Murray McShane's uh, famous saying, for every look at sin, look ten times at Christ. So stare the ugliness of sin in its face, but then look at the beauty and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. One thing that has been helpful to kind of um, uh, accelerate that in my life is uh, thinking about uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who said that we should practice slow repentance, not quick repentance. And I think evangelicals tend to practice quick repentance. Lord, forgive me. Throw it up and then just kind of move on. And, and, and Kierkegaard says, you should sit with the Lord until you, the, your guilt is vivid before your eyes. And I think um, for a long time, and I still struggle with this, but this guilt was just kind of like, I was just banking on the cross and moving on. And so I didn't get the tenfold glory of Christ because I was really minimizing my guilt. But it's sitting with your guilt in the presence of a forgiving and glorious Christ that, in fact, my heart is ravished with him again. So, I mean, those are some thinkers that have helped me, you know, as I struggle with this, you know, day in and day out. Yeah, I think you've referenced more authors tonight than I've read. Oh. Um, so I was just super <laughs> impressed by that. Um, yeah, um, so I think we're all, we're all pastors and ministry leaders, and I think if all of us were put on the spot, hey, whose church is it? I would hope that all of us would give that kind of Sunday school answer. What's the answer? Jesus, okay. Wow, you guys are really confident about that. Um, <laughs> but, but yet, I think there's things that we do that betray, betray that we really think it's our church. Um, and so what are, what are some of the ways that we as pastors um, or you yourself have, have experienced seeing or acting like the church is really your church? Mm -hmm. And how has that hindered joy? How has that hindered endurance? Um, I, I think of a season in which uh, an elder uh, tried to kind of get me out of the church and uh, kind of began to gossip and uh, bring charges that weren't biblical. It was just... Um, you're not approachable. And, but the, these, these people began to listen to him, and so it was a, a threat that the church might split. And um, this was a close friend. This was someone we had dinner with on a regular basis. You know, this was, um, this was very painful. And I remember being in our living room with my wife, and we were just like, if you defend yourself, you play into the, the trap of being unapproachable. And so we couldn't defend ourselves. Um, but we had a defender. And so we, uh, but one night it was just, uh, it was brutal, and we, um, we were crying out to the Lord, and um, I was on my knees with my arms stretched up, and I was just asking the Lord to save the church and to save us. And then we got a text from someone um, that said that they were thinking of us, they didn't know what was going on, but they wanted to remind us that, like Peter, who sank in the waters, Jesus would reach out his hand and pull us up. And um, uh, after that, we got an email from a pastor who, long story short, said, um, uh, the guy that's doing that in your church did it in our church, and it crushed us, and my wife's never recovered. And they come to find out we were just kind of all, one of the stops along the way, multiple churches. Well, why the story? Um, it was helpful to be in a place where I could do nothing for the church but pray. 
And in being in that place, I was reminded that Christ is the divine warrior and protector and sustainer of the church. And that was a gift to me, to see him work, him defend, and him care for his church. And it required none of my skills or my sermons or my counseling or anything of me. It was all him, that unilateral work of Christ. So um, that was a moment uh, that has stuck. I think it probably provoked in me more dependence on God and praying and um, more confidence that he is the warrior that we need him to be. Wow, that's good. Um, We've got a lot of questions. You know, you kind of, uh, you mentioned uh, in your uh, sermon, you know, you had to shut down the church Mm. that you planted. Um, and in some regards, I think you even called out, hey, maybe this might be some of your worst nightmares. And so, uh, obviously, we're on the other side of that now, right? You're still here. Praise God, right? Yeah. Um, and so, in shutting down the church you planted, can you just talk uh, a little bit about what led up to that decision? Kind of like how that, how that went uh, and, what it, and what it taught you as a pastor, and, and particularly in, in terms of, of endurance and then, and then you know, Every story kind of has an arc, right? I love how you talked about that bee, uh, you know, of Christ and his work. But and how have you seen God's grace and glory in the ministry now? Um, so just walk us through that journey. Well, I, I'm going to share some of that story over, over the next couple of days. Exactly. So um, uh, I'm not holding back no. uh, on the details of that. Um, you know, uh, maybe just some things that I'm not going to share. I remember having a sense of being called away from the church and um, being called into this ministry that I'm in now. And um, my wife and I were pretty confident this is what God was calling us to do. So I went to the elders and I told them and they said, we thought you'd just keep doing ministry to pastors but still be our pastor, but we understand and we affirm that call. And so I stepped back and the elders made the decision of what to do next with our church. And we looked at merging, we looked at... um, we had a pastor candidate that we were very, very interested in. He was interested in us. Um, we had uh, plenty of money. We had great leaders. Um, we had a healthy church. Um, it, it, and so it, the elders were all over the place and um, different perspectives on what we should do. And then one night, we were together in a meeting, and uh, an elder describes it like this. It was like God wrote down a message on a piece of paper and tore up it into five pieces. And one by one, each elder turned over his piece. And it was a a very clear, unilateral um, word from the Holy Spirit that we should recognize, is this the end of City Life? Not the end of the church, but that we needed to dissolve the church and send our uh, healthy people into other churches. And, um, you know, uh, learning to step back and to trust the elders Uh, was important in that decision. Um, Waiting for the Spirit to speak instead of me speaking and saying, I had a sense this was going to happen. Um, And letting the Lord speak to them. What if we had ended up with two elders, yes, two elders, no, you know, and then I had to do a tie break. I mean, that would have been just so hard for the church. So it it was pastorally prudent (laughs) to not over-involve myself in speaking, but to pray and to trust the Lord that will work through his appointed elders. So that, that was a, a lesson, you know, learned through that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share a lot more about that story. Um, you know, one thing that was inter- uh, might be instructive to people who are going through this or have been through is I began to grieve the loss of the church before we lost the church. Um, so that when it came kind of the official day, um, I had kind of worked through a lot of that, but I needed to be emotionally present to pastor people who hadn't. And that was something that I I had to, I actually prayed, um, we had two months before we closed after the announcement, and I just kept praying, Lord, help me to be emotionally present with your people, even though my heart was moving into a different ministry. Um, And so that was important. I also remember just looking at the elders and go, what what about this marriage? What about this uh, seeker? Well, what's going to happen, you know? And we were just so um, comforted by the fact that Christ sustains the church. The church is eternal. Um, the local church is temporary. 
And of course, we loved and we met with people and we counseled them and we encouraged them. But you know, those are a few things that that I don't plan on talking about that might be helpful. Yeah, so. Sure. Um, well, a lot of uh, kind of questions and comments kind of came in around. It, it's very evident, uh, right? You know, that th- you have this sense of being a connoisseur of God's glory, of God's grace. Uh, So a lot of people are really looking for some practical helps uh, in terms of either spiritual disciplines, uh, particular books or resources um, that you would recommend Mm -hmm. if somebody is struggling with the idea of Mm -hmm. of being still and beholding. I think we all want that. But what are just some very simple helps, practical steps, uh, resources that you'd want to recommend for us as we think about Yeah. um, I'm inspired by John Owen, who I quoted at the beginning. He has a book called The Glory of Christ. Uh, it'd be a good book to very slowly read through and uh, you know, look at the glory of Christ through his eyes as he uh, reflects on Scripture. Um, going for walks and uh, you know, leaving the phone behind. Um, and, and also praying aloud. I don't know if you noticed, but when you're speaking, it's harder to think about yourself when you're speaking aloud. Uh, and that's helpful in prayer, you know. So as you pray aloud, you, it, it helps fight off the interrogating and con- condemning voices that might creep in. Um, and of course, that's the enemy. Um, uh, Christ, uh, Christ never condemns us, right? Um, uh, that's the that's the voice of the accuser. Christ rejoices over us. Um, so uh, I think you know, praying out loud and uh, praying to Him as if He's there as you would your best friend. Um, in a season where it's really hard, it's okay just to say, it really hurts, Lord. Will you take it away? Yeah. In a great season, Lord, I'm so grateful for the growth of the church. You know, thank you for that. Would you give more? I mean, you know, just talking to Christ as though he's there in front of you, because he is. He's before you, he's beneath you, he's beside you. He's, you know, the the prayer the from St. Patrick. So. He's an all-encompassing Christ, and so he wants to hear everything. He's not too busy for you. Um, He's not uh, put off by your sins. He's moving towards you always because of the cross and because of his great love for you. And so, um, you know, those are some things. Uh, Get around people, maybe, that you sense they have a a love for Jesus or you see what you're you're seeing, the connoisseur, and, uh, you know, hey, will you mentor me or, you know, would you share with me? you know, some insights with me. Um, but I just, I do think we are so busy and we are so driven to perform uh, that uh, regular Sabbath to turn off performance and open up ourselves to uh, connoisseur activity, you know, to sitting down, to beholding the glory of Christ in scripture and in creation and culture. So <clears throat> um, just the pace that we run at, uh, we, we need to interrupt it in order to behold Jesus on a regular basis. So um, practically, I would uh, have a Sabbath every week, and then um, every month uh, the staff would take a half day off, and it was dedicated to prayer, and I would go to this, you know, shocker, I would go to this park (laughs) and just walk around and talk to the Lord, you know, for whatever's on my heart, you know, no agenda. Um, And then uh, a sabbatical, you know, every seven years, you know, uh, just creating rhythms in which you are disengaging from ministry and performance, and you're opening your heart. I mean, even the Son of God withdrew to a desolate place to pray. And it wasn't because it was like he didn't have a pillow or it wasn't comfortable. It was desolate. It was, it was It's solitary. The idea is that you're alone. He's alone with his Father. Um, there's a German theologian that says, only the silent can hear. That sounds obvious, but... Only the silent can hear the voice of God. We have to withdraw from the chaotic, busy, noisy lives that we lead, withdraw to a desolate place in order to hear the voice of God. I'm really hoping that this week for us can be a time of Sabbath rest. Um, And so I'm just thankful. Having those rhythms interrupted, maybe this is a time of of holy disruption Mm. uh, for you. Um, Last question, uh, as the band's getting ready to come up to lead us in worship. Uh, There's some questions around, um, what does it mean to be a theologian in resident? Um, And what is, um, it it started with, talk to about your transition. It's 2024, so I want to be careful on what we were talking about with that. Talk about your transition from lead, see, we're all awake now. Um, uh, No, talk about your transition from lead pastor to pastor uh, 
uh, or theologian in residence, and how has that either helped or hindered your spiritual health? Yeah, well, I appreciate that question. Uh, theologian in residence does not mean that I have all the answers, theologian, nor does it mean it's a temporary role, residence. So it's very confusing. <laughs> um, it is, uh, I'm a, a position at a church called Citizens Church, and uh, they have about 40 staff, so I'm available to mentor pastors. Um, and I, I am starting a theological institute there. I do teaching and preaching, and then they also encourage me to write. So writing, teaching, preaching, mentoring pastors, that's kind of what I do. Yeah. I, I, love, I love this role. It is very life-giving, the second part of the question, yeah. because I'm taking failures and successes from the past, and I'm stepping uh, behind these guys who are on the front line. I see myself as on the, the back lines now. And I'm able to go, hey, have you seen this trend with this staff member? Can you tell me more about this process? And I'm able to help them think about things and see things that they're they're just too busy to see or inexperienced to see. And it's just so beautifully redemptive to call upon my own failures and say, and, and to come to these pastors and help them uh, hopefully make some better and wiser decisions. There is so much joy in that for me right now. Um, as much, if not more joy than, than preaching and teaching because it, it was able to help these young pastors flourish. Mm. And man, what if I had had a theologian, somebody like that in my life, man, that would have been wonderful. So um, hire a theologian. <laughs> Who can afford that? Right? Yeah, yeah. So. Well, they can in Texas, I guess. There you That's go. awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pastors need pastors. Ministers need ministers. Jonathan, thank you for ministering to us this evening. Can I give him a hand for serving us tonight? I'm sure you're...